Well, this is our second week in hospitality. This week's sermon is entitled God's Hospitable People. Last week was uh, that we focused on God being hospitable. And now we're going to focus on what does it look like for God's people to be a hospitable people. And uh, I want to start with Romans chapter 15, verse 7, which reads, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That's what we talked on last week. We're going to start with that this week. You know, for me, the first time I remember really encountering biblical hospitality was when I was in college. I lived with my college pastor named Mike for a couple years, and he let me live there rent-free so long as I continued to uh, play sports, go to college, and uh, make sure that I was serving in the church. So we used to meet on Fridays after football practice and baseball practice and whatnot. And then um, we'd meet at a coffee shop right next door was a pizza spot. And so I would get there early and uh, I would get my coffee and I would read my Bible and I would do whatnot, um, whatever I needed to do. Mike would then join me a little bit later and uh, we would talk and we'd hang out. And then he would go next door and get the pizza and bring into the coffee shop the pizza. And he'd smell up the whole place with pizza and they allowed it for whatever reason but I was grateful for it because Mike always bought the pizza and we ate it together and he never asked me to pay for anything so he let me live rent free he oftentimes um, helped me uh, with different things that I needed as a broke college kid and I was really grateful for him well one Friday we were interrupted in our conversation by um, this kind of leather necked construction worker who was a little you know rough under the collar kind of kind of guy and uh, we started to pray for our meal, and then he started laughing, like laughing, like at us. And uh, so then we just went on and kept eating, and then we were talking about the Bible, and he goes, you actually read that? And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't know what to do. Um, I'm only like a year and a half old in the faith, and so I'm like, this is new to me. I heard that this stuff happens, but I've never experienced it. And so I'm just looking at Mike like, do something. What are you <laughs> And uh, this particular Friday, um, we just kind of introduced ourselves, and, and uh, it was a good, good time. And then the following Friday, the man shows up and, and does the same exact thing, um, just kind of asking us questions. But we hadn't had the pizza yet. And so Mike gets up, and he goes and gets the pizza, and he leaves me there <laughs> with Gary. And so I'm sitting there looking at Gary, and I'm an awkward dude. That's my spiritual gift is social awkwardness. <laughs> And so I'm just staring at him and he's staring at me and we're kind of like, you know, like trying to, it, it's just weird. And uh, so he asked me this question. He goes, let me ask you a question. Why is Mike like this? And uh, I remember answering specifically, well, I think it's because Jesus loves Mike. And uh, the guy had a church background and uh, as we talked, we, I watched Mike ask him question after question about, you know, where he's from and what he does. And so we learned a lot about, about Gary. We learned about his marriage problems, his money problems, his work problems. We prayed for him. We talked a lot over the weeks. And, um, and I remember saying, it's because Jesus loves Mike. And so Mike responded to me. He goes, don't you mean it's because Mike loves Jesus? And I went, oh. And then I was thinking about it, and I went, oh, man, this guy... He's probably right. It's because Mike loves Jesus that Mike is so hospitable and loving. But then it hit me. No, actually. No, no. Mike is the way he is because Mike knows how much Jesus loves him. And because of how much Mike knows Jesus loves him, Mike is the way he is. And uh, we sat together, the three of us, for months after that, every Friday. And we talked and uh, Mike and I's special little Friday time turned into a trio. But that was when I was introduced to biblical hospitality, where we invited this man into our lives. We invited this man into our space. We bought dinner for each other. We laughed. We prayed. We cried. It was awesome. And so when I come across a passage like Romans 15, 7, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God, I always flash back to Mike. And I always flash back to that time in that coffee shop. Last week, we learned about hospitality a little bit. We talked about how hospitality incorporates the concept of welcome and reception. If you remember, I quoted from Amy Oden's book called God's Welcome. She writes, gospel hospitality is God's welcome, a welcome that is deep and wide. 
Gospel hospitality is God's welcome into a new way of seeing and living. Ultimately, gospel hospitality is God's welcome into abundant life, into his own life. As we participate in gospel hospitality, God's welcome becomes a way of life that we share with the world. And so I talked about how welcome uh, as an ingredient of hospitality involves three things. One is where you invite somebody into your life, you receive them into your life, you receive them into your space, and you also welcome them in the sense that you find people who are in danger and you grab them by the hand and you walk them to a place of safety where they can be healed, comforted. And by the way, that third component of hospitality, of welcome, is where we get the word hospital. It's the concept of we actually gather people who are sick and in danger and all that and we walk them by loving service to a place of safety and health. So hospitality incorporates all these kinds of ideas. And and to help show us how the two go together, this concept of welcome and reception, it's not either welcoming or being receptive and receiving people, but it's both. And it comes from uh, Luke chapter 15. And uh, I love to show this because there's a Greek word that is used that is tra- can be translated in two different ways. It can be translated as welcome. It can be translated as receive. And so when you read in the ESV, in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, you'll read, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives, there's our word, sinners, and eats with them. And so Jesus told them this parable. And then Jesus proceeds to tell them the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son. And the prodigal son is very popular. We all know the prodigal son, but do you know the reason why Jesus taught the prodigal son parable? To help us understand hospitality. That's why. But when you read it in the NIV, it's a different word. NIV reads, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Same word, translated in two different ways. Why that's important is because we need to understand both welcome and reception to receive someone is coming from the same word and it means basically the same thing. You are receiving someone into your life, into your space, and perhaps even welcoming them into a place where they go from danger to safety. That's important because it reminds us that Jesus considered hospitality a very important thing. Remember what hospitality is defined as? It's generously leveraging our resources in loving service to others for the glory of God. Generously leveraging our resources for the glory of God. To lovingly serve others. That's the important part. The glory of God, lovingly serving others, generously using our resources, making sure we know all three of those. Joshua Jipp in his book called Saved by Faith and Hospitality, he writes this. Divine hospitality comes to us in the person of Jesus, the divine host who extends God's hospitality to sinners, outcasts, and strangers, and thereby draws them and us into friendship with God. God's embrace of humanity into friendship with with him is the ultimate form of welcoming the stranger. Our friendship with God is the foundation of and cause for our friendship with one another. Jesus grants divine hospitality to the other without distinction. And this is exemplified in his welcome to sinners and the religious, to men and to women, to rich and to poor, to Jews and to Gentiles. Jesus shows no apprehension or fear of associating with the stigmatized in society. Do you notice that the religious leaders were grumbling and murmuring that Jesus was receiving or welcoming sinners? What was their beef with Jesus? Answer, he was being hospitable. They didn't like it. And he was being hospitable to sinners, which means he was receiving them into his life, eating with them, having time with them called table fellowship. I love this because it reminds us Jesus fellowshiped and was hospitable and welcomed sinners, but Here's the caveat. Jesus didn't sin with sinners. There's a big difference. And so we have to make sure that we understand the two. So let me pray for us as we jump into Matthew chapter 18 where we see 
an example of how Jesus welcomes and receives and how we should go and do likewise. Father, would you give us the Holy Spirit in such abundance that as we come to your word that you would illumine our minds, that you would transform our hearts, and that you would conform our wills to yours. So God, what we're about to see is going to be a challenge for many of us. It's going to seem daunting and downright impossible. So God, would you overcome our resistance? God, would you humble us under the might and under the beauty of your grace? And God, would you transform us into more and more the image of Jesus, which is your great delight and desire? So God, teach us now, we pray for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 15, 7, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. Last week we talked about how Christ welcomed us, that is by giving of his life and by his blood he has drawn people into fellowship with him. And so he is the great host who welcomes sinners to his own person, his own, in his own life. And then he also invites us to repent and believe in the gospel that Jesus is crucified and risen. And in so doing, we are adopted as his children. We bear his name and are welcomed into his home called the church. Beautiful. But now we're going to add something to that. Jesus welcomes or receives children. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. We read, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and they were saying, and here's a question they asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> that, that question is dripping with pride. Jesus, we want to know who is the greatest in the kingdom. Is it me? Is it Peter? Is it John? Who is it? So in response, Jesus calls a child to himself and he put the child in the midst of them. And he says in verse three, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And the word received there is welcome. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So a discussion has arisen about who is the greatest in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is going to answer this question by bringing this child into their midst. And having the child in their midst, he says, you see this child? You need to be like this child. That's your answer. Jesus doesn't mean that we need to all become childish where we play with our toys and we're learning our ABCs and we're figuring out how to match our clothes. No, Jesus wants us to be childlike. That's why he says you have to be like this child. And so my question is, what is it like to be a child? What does it mean to be childlike? And the first thing we have to realize is to be a child is to be dependent on others. Children, especially younger children, they are not independent. They cannot fend for themselves, protect themselves, or provide for themselves. They are dependent on others. And so that is why it is heartbreaking for us to see children who are neglected. Because we know that they are not being cared for. They are dependent on others. And the others who they depend on are not dependable. And we don't like to see that. Another thing about children is they are of low social standing. And what I mean by that is in society, they have a kind of a low standing. They don't contribute a lot to the society. They're not CEOs or judges or professors. And so we see them as low standing in society. That does not mean we don't value children. <laughs> okay, we don't, we, we don't not value children. We, we love children. We, they're a blessing from God. We understand that. But children are not gigantic contributors to society. They have a low standing. You tracking with me, church? I want to make sure I'm clear on that. Any questions? Raise your hand. I do not want to be accused of being a kid hater or something like that. But this is why it's imperative for those of us who are adults to not abuse children or to neglect them or to mistreat them. Why? Because they are vulnerable. Children are of low social standing and dependent, and therefore we must protect them as adults. That's the ethic that stands behind that. In other words, children are humble. 
And Jesus says, unless you, in verse 4, humble yourself like a child, meaning unless you become dependent and you embrace your identity as a dependent and you understand your vulnerability and your low standing compared to God, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But then there's this other part that Jesus says in verse 5. Not only is it about us understanding that we must be humble and we must understand ourselves to be dependent on God, but the way in which we act towards others is that we are to receive one such child or those who are childlike in Jesus' name because in so doing, we welcome or receive Jesus himself. In other words, hospitality is about welcoming others into your life, and the others must include those who are dependent, lowly, vulnerable, and humble. But the welcome itself must be done by those who are likewise humble, dependent, lowly, and vulnerable. We, as those who have been received into Christ's life by his grace and mercy, come as dependent, vulnerable sinners to a God who saves us, forgives us, reconciles us, and calls us his own. So we are called to also extend that same welcome, the welcome Christ has welcomed us with, to others meaning we continue to understand our dependency, humility, and vulnerability, and we extend that welcome that we ourselves have received to others who are likewise vulnerable, humble, and dependent, so that those who have received our welcome are really being introduced to God's welcome. And when we extend that welcome to the vulnerable, to the dependent, to the humble, we are extending the very welcome of God and we are introducing people into the very love and grace of God. So when we close our heart off to people and we choose not to be hospitable, we are choosing not to communicate and share the hospitality of God that we ourselves have received. Did you get all that, church? Okay. So when we turn to Mark chapter 9, what we actually see here is a different kind of take on the same exact event that's happening where Mark records it that they being the disciples and Jesus came to Capernaum and when Jesus was in the house, this is taking place in a hospitable environment. When Jesus was in the house, he asked them, the disciples, what were you discussing on the way? So now we get some more light into what was happening. They're traveling to Capernaum and the disciples are like, Dude, you're not the best. I'm the best. No, no, no. You're the best. You're, you're dumb. You, you forgot the bread when we crossed on the, the, the thing. And you, no, uh, you, you see what's happening right here? Those of us who have children, we're going, ah, oh, yeah, we know that very well. They're bickering. So Jesus asked, what were you guys talking about? They kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So Jesus sat down, called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, he said, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Did you see it? When we welcome the vulnerable, the dependent, the lowly, the humble, we are not merely welcoming them in a spiritual and profound way, we are welcoming Jesus himself. How is that possible? It's because every human being, regardless of their social standing, regardless of their socioeconomic background, education, skin color, or interests, every human being bears the image of God. Which means Jesus is the perfect human and every human being who is redeemed and reconciled by Jesus is going to be conformed into his image, according to Romans 8. And so every time we welcome an image bearer, a fellow image bearer, we are really welcoming the ultimate image bearer, Jesus himself. We will read about this in Matthew 25 at the Initiate Conference, about how doing to others we do to Christ. 
This is an important feature. We just did a child dedication where we bring the children into the presence of the church to remind us that it is our responsibility as a church to walk alongside parents to help them disciple and nurture their kids in the admonition and teaching of the Lord. Because God loves children. And children are a great reminder of what it means to be a follower of his. But how does hospitality work itself out and how does it connect this concept of love and service? You see, our welcoming of others is offering to others the welcome of God. Hospitality, in fact, is that link. It is what links love and service. And I'm going to show you this from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 8. The Apostle Peter writes, above all, meaning this is of supreme importance, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a, mul- covers a multitude of sins. He says, above all, keep loving each other earnestly. What this indicates for us is that love is a supreme thing. It's of great importance because love is the crown jewel of Christianity. You remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13? It's the great love chapter. We read in verse 1, the apostle Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as, so as to move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And so verse 13, he says, now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Do you see what he just wrote? Above spiritual gifts that wow us and above sacrifice that inspires us and above faith that motivates us is love. You can look at Mount Diablo and cause it to go into the oceans, but if you don't love, you're nothing. Whoa. That means you can have loveless spiritual gifts, loveless faith, and loveless sacrifice. It is possible. And if there is lovelessness in those things, those things are accounted as nothing. It's the Bible. How is that possible? How is it possible for us to be doing these amazing things and yet to do these things without love for these things to be rendered nothing? And I have two reasons. Firstly is this. Love cannot be equated with deeds. We cannot equate love with deeds. Now there's a big movement right now in Christianity. And I think it's, it's a good movement because it's trying to cause the pendulum to swing in a different direction. So I commend it. But right now there's a lot of people talking about love does. It has to do something. And I would say yes and amen. But doing loving deeds cannot be at the expense of having loving feelings. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that love rejoices in the truth. How do you rejoice in an unfeeling way? You can't. You can't. And so what I would say is we need not interpret or understand love as deeds, nor should we interpret love as merely emotion. God has made us more complex than that, which is love includes both emotion and deeds. And so we must pursue loving others both practically and deed-orientedly, but also with our heart and affections. It needs to be both. So that's one way we can do loveless deeds is by equating deeds with love, and that, that isn't, that's not biblical. It's too, it's not complex enough. 
Second reason is this. Second reason why it's possible to have all these things happen and yet have lovelessness involved in it and to be rendered nothing is that we can do great deeds without love if or when our motivations for the deed when they are misplaced. Let me say it again. If you have misplaced motivations, then the good deeds that you do are not rendered loving because you're doing them for all the wrong reasons. Let me give an example or a few examples. If we do deeds to others and our motivation is misplaced, you'll see it in the fact that our motivation is confined to ourselves. It's confined to ourselves, which means we have a need to feel good about ourselves or we have a need to appease or satisfy some sort of guilty conscience we have about not serving enough or whatever. Or we have a need for appreciation. We feel that our ego has not been addressed enough. And so we will serve others in deeds and hopes that they will reciprocate by lavishing praise on us. Oh, you're wonderful. And then we will soak in that. But really our deeds towards others is not about the others. It's about us and about our identity and about our self-worth. And we need people to make much of us. Or lastly, we have a fear of criticism. We don't want to be criticized, and so we do deeds in order to avoid it. And if this is a part of our motivation for why we do deeds, we have not loved. You have not loved. Because you have made the purpose or the motivation of your deeds about you. You are seeking to meet your own needs, not the needs of your neighbor. And misplaced love occurs when a person does a deed with the good of themselves in mind rather than the good of their neighbor in mind. I was reading an article, and uh, this helps solidify for, for me um, exactly what this means. It's written by a guy named Steve Whitmer, and uh, it's entitled, Love Them More, Need Them Less how to serve one another better. And he gave this illustration, and I thought it was great. He says this, imagine, he was on a, on a flight. He says, imagine if the pilot of my flight, as we approached the landing, had become deeply, obsessively concerned about how each of the 200 passengers was evaluating his piloting. Imagine if he had begun to worry about a too bumpy landing and the displeasure this would cause in first class and in economy. I suspect that an obsessive passenger pleasing anxiety in the pilot of my plane might have led to a crash. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Instead of attempting to please 200 passengers, our pilot focused on satisfying just one person, the air traffic controller in Providence, Rhode Island. And because the controller was his singular focus, he was able to serve all 200 passengers much better. He concludes, when we need others less, we can serve them more. How is that possible? When we need other people to s stroke our ego, when we need to serve other people in order to kind of satisfy some guilty conscience thing that we got going on, we are using them. And we are unable to truly love them and to serve them because our motivation, our preoccupation, our attention is fundamentally about us. And I know this to be true because I have experienced it where I have served somebody and loved somebody to the best of my ability and they didn't say thank you. <laughs> and what happened to me, I thought in my head, how dare you not say thank you? Do you know what I've done for you? 
Do you know how much sacrifice? Do you know how much work went into this? Do you know how much planning this? Do you know how much effort this is? Do you know, understand at all how hard this was for me to do this for you? Can't you at least say thank you? My love and service towards them was about me, not about them. And therefore, I did not love and serve them. I was trying to meet my own needs. I've also tried to love and serve others to try to get away from criticism. I don't want people to belittle me or think badly of me. And so I will serve and I will love not because I actually feel anything or I want anything. I'm motivated by making sure I don't, I don't displease anyone. That is not love. That is a misplaced love. Because really what you want is to have your needs met, not your neighbor. Jesus is the perfect example of one who did not have misplaced love and misplaced emotions and misplaced motivations. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Jesus took upon himself the sins of those whom he would redeem by his blood. And Jesus put the needs of his neighbors ahead of his own. Jesus sought to please his neighbor and build them up in Christ's likeness to do spiritual good to them, a great sacrifice to himself. Jesus is the perfect example. John Piper provides this definition of love, and I think this is so helpful. He says this, love is the overflow of joy in God that gladly meets the needs of others. Love is the overflow of joy in God that gladly meets the needs of others. When you see people in need, you gladly meet their need. Not because you know that in meeting their need, they're going to somehow stroke your ego and make you feel good about yourself, but you will gladly meet their need because of the immense joy you have swelling up in your heart for all of the grace and all of the mercy and all of the ways that God has richly poured out his love on us through Christ. And as we contemplate the sacrifice of Jesus and the humility of Jesus and the love of Jesus that he welcomes us into his life at great sacrifice through his death and resurrection, that joy wells up in us and overflows out of us so that we find ways to love and serve others, to meet their needs because the joy inside of us cannot be contained. It's got to get out. That's why Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. The watching world is looking at the church and asking themselves the question, does the church love itself? That's what that verse says. Does the church love itself? And if the church does not love itself, we are not meeting each other's needs. We're not praying with each other. We're not lovingly serving one another in hospitality. If we're not doing that and displaying the love of God in the way in which we love each other, the watching world will conclude they must not be disciples of Jesus. For Jesus says, all people will know you are my disciples by or if you have love for one another. If the church sacrificially loves one another, the watching world will conclude, wow, they must truly believe and follow Jesus. But love can't be a drive-by kind of love. It can't be a one-hit wonder. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Therefore, love must be constant. That's why the apostle Peter says, keep on loving one another. We're really good at doing like random acts of kindness. And I think in large part, and sorry if this offends you, not sorry, not sorry kind of thing. <laughs> random acts of kindness are easy and they make us feel good about ourselves. But loving someone, inviting them into our lives, meeting their needs is hard. It's messy. It's unpredictable, it's costly, and we look at the two, quick and easy, or long and hard, 
We're Americans. We go quick and easy. If I can microwave love, I'll do it. But love endures all things. And so when the messiness comes and the hardness comes and you want to throw in the towel and quit and you go, this person is just annoying me and they're so frustrating. Remember, God's love never fails. And therefore, your love must endure. It must be constant. Love must be earnestly sought and given. That's what Peter says. He says, keep on loving one another earnestly. Keep finding new ways of doing it. Keep at it. And when you feel like quitting, don't quit. Verse 10 and 11. Each has received a gift. Those in the church have received a gift. And we are to use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So by God's grace, he's given us a gift. Each and every one of us has a gift. And we are to steward that gift to leverage our resources to serve one another. And he gives examples in verse 11, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God and whoever serves, and look at this, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Oh, there's supply. If we will commit to lovingly serving people, the humble, the vulnerable, and anyone else, starting with the church and extending and overflowing out into the community, it will be messy and it will be hard and you'll want to quit, but you can't quit because love endures all things. And then right when you feel that you're at your weakest and you're completely spent, you have nothing left, verse 11 comes in, the promises of God are true. God will supply. God will come through on his promises. God will be there in your need. God will meet you where you are. God will be everything you need and more. Test him on this. See if God won't come through. Our God is not a liar. He will come through. So keep loving. Keep serving. For God will supply the energy and God will supply the strength. And the purpose of God's supply is so that, in order that, in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, at the point at which you are spent and you have nothing left to offer, that's exactly where God comes in. Remember 2 Corinthians 13? In your weakness, who is strong? God is strong. And God shows himself strong in order that God may get the glory. So that in supplying you with what you need, God gets the glory and you lovingly serve your neighbor. Beautiful. Now, how does hospitality fit into this? Good question. Notice I skipped verse 9. Were you paying attention? You weren't. <laughs> Verse 9. Here's the connection. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Love. Verse 8. Verse 10 and 11. Serve. Trust God to supply. How do we link love and service? How do we, how do we connect those two? Show hospitality without grumbling. If we will be hospitable, that is welcoming and receiving those into our life, into our space, and helping people to walk into a place where they go from danger into safety, we will connect for people the love of God and the way in which God serves us in dying and rescuing, rescuing us from our sins. Hospitality is the link where we generously leverage our resources in loving service to others for the glory of God. That's why you see in your notes, uh, 1 John 3. If anyone has the world's goods, verse 17, and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? In other words, if you have the supply and you are not resourcing and being a good steward of God's supply when people are in need, how in the world can you claim that God's love is in you? You can't. Verse 18, let us not love in word and talk, but in deed and in truth. We have to love in deed, but we have to love in truth, and love rejoices in the truth, and so we need to love and feel, or we need to love by doing and feeling. 
And then you get James chapter 2 where a brother and sister are poorly clothed in verse 15, lacking in daily food. And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things they need for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it, is, if it does not have works, it's dead. In other words, hospitality is where love and service meet. It is where we do spiritual good to others that they would be built up in Christ's likeness. We're not looking to please ourselves. We are looking to please our neighbor for their good, Romans 15. We are to welcome the humble, welcome the lowly, welcome the vulnerable, welcome the dependent, because in welcoming them, we welcome Christ for his glory. Hospitality is leveraging our resources and loving service of others for the glory of God. It is out of our being welcomed by God that we in turn welcome others for God. It is our being loved that we love others. It is because of our reception of grace that we extend grace to others. It is out of being sacrificed for that we are willing to sacrifice for others. And likewise, hospitality then becomes the measure of whether or not the love of God is dwelling in your hearts, evidenced by faith. Do you have saving faith? The answer will be, am I being hospitable? According to James 2 and 1 John 3. But it's going to be hard, Phil. I know. But it's going to take so much. I, I know. But they may eat my food. <laughs> they may trample dirt on my new carpet. I know. No. But I don't have a lot of time. I know. I'm socially awkward. I know. <laughs> whatever resource you have, whatever you have to offer, spend it. Whether it's little or much, spend it. Spend it in loving service of others. 